I'm Jerry Olenek with you here at Green Sky Adventures where today we'd like to point out some of the finer features of our Micromong 2XF. Now as many of you may be familiar with the Micromong uh, which was designed by Ed Fisher to race their designs back in 1993 uh, as an ultralight and uh, there have been plans sold for the Micromong for ever since that time. We acquired the design from Ed Fisher back in 1994. Now the 2XF is a term that we came up with a few years ago that uh, basically is involved with the transition from two-stroke to four-stroke engines, particularly the HKS 700E from Japan. Now the concept being that two times the strokes, two times the fun. Depends on your perspective of the two strokes, but uh, nevertheless that's the, the 2XF. Along with that there are a number of airframe changes and improvements that are incorporated into this uh, aircraft today which have not really flowed through into the plans built versions. The, the 2XF is the Micromong but with a number of changes. And we're going to describe some of those today. The significant changes that we're talking about, uh, what you might see is obvious. There's a, a number of uh, aluminum flat wrap panels that have replaced uh, areas of fabric on the aircraft. Where originally in ultralight form, the, uh, the boot cowl was uh, a flat wrap aluminum as well as the cowling. And uh, that, that was worked out well. The fabric is light, of course, but when it comes time to do a condition inspection like we're doing now on this particular Micromong 2XF, the, uh, uh, being able to take the uh, belly pan off all the way back to the, uh, the seat back station it really allows uh, a, for a better inspection and it gives us opportunity to also clean clean uh, the aircraft inside as well as out. And following along that theme, we have also uh, incorporated optionally uh, a couple of years ago an aluminum turtle deck. Now uh, it will become standard equipment here shortly in 2016, but the aluminum turtle deck allows us to basically take the, the top of the fuselage off for inspection. There's a elevator push rod tube that uh, runs from the elevator bell crank all the way back to the elevator, obviously, to, to contro control that uh, control surface. And there's ball joints involved, there's bolts, and uh, there's, there's a, a carry through for the horizontal stabilizer. They all can be inspected and they can, they can be adjusted. And uh, in the event of an unfortunate circumstance, there can be repairs. And did I mention earlier that the tail spring provides a lot of uh, uh, nice ride for ta taxiing and absorbs uh, a fair bit of uh, landing loads, especially if you are doing three-point landings. And uh, the specifics of the uh, tail spring and the, the geometry of the steering, I'll get into that with, in a little bit more detail just a little bit later. One of the most exciting improvements that we made with the 2XF is a substantial uh, improvement in roll control, roll rate, uh, just the overall uh, nice light feel of the ailerons with a uh, uh, very brisk response and uh, which is a, a huge improvement over uh, previous plans versions and we will show you detail of that shortly.
that goes into the Micromong 2XF in strengthening the center section is a half inch 035 4132 that welds in between the lower longerons. It also welds against the landing gear sockets and this gives some additional resistance to it twisting in the event of a very hard landing. When you make one change in an aircraft, it's often said that there are going to be many other changes to follow or that it will be, will be related. With the Micromong 2XF, this has been done actually to our advantage. Notice here the uh, cross bracing on the bottom portion of fuselage has been moved forward from the landing, uh, the center section of the landing gear carry through to the uh, new half inch 035 tube that was welded in in, uh, in our first change. That gives us a weld point uh, for uh, some uh, other changes that we'll discuss a little bit later. But significantly, the, this cross bracing now, rather than a continuous tube from back at the seat back station all the way to the firewall, that, that tube stops at the uh, that first cross piece that was just recently incorporated in the design and it starts again on the other side of that. Have tube 3 and 4 are separate tubes now and they go forward and uh, terminate at the uh, firewall station as uh, you would see in your normal plans. In this view, with tubes 5 and 6, we've strengthened the carry-through section, which uh, supports the landing gear sockets, and also that is a carry-through for the wing struts. You'll see on tube number 5, it just completes the triangle, or actually uh, turns one triangle into two, and then uh, because of the tube that we put in ahead of that between the landing gear sockets, uh, we can add one more brace, number six, which really serves between five and six. It holds that uh, the top portion of that carry-through section in column. Here in number seven, this image is shot from behind the seat back station. Uh, number seven, you see the arrows are pointing at the uh, aileron bell point, bell crank pivot points. And the tube that gets welded in between those as a, a tie rod more or less, it prevents the lower longerons from bowing in and out under extreme uh, stick forces uh, as the uh, speeds of this aircraft have gone from a typical 55, 60 mile an hour ultralight upwards uh, approaching 100 miles an hour. And so the resistance uh, on our huge ailerons is quite substantial and this is just one change that was made with the 2XF that uh, improves roll rate. Here frame number eight is actually the same as frame number seven uh, that this is in air so we can uh, quickly go to our next frame. Number nine is pointing towards the elevator bell crank. Now, there's a departure from the plans here. Uh, the first thing, uh, if you would refer to your plans uh, on the control column, you will see that, that the top of the elevator bell crank is a uh, rod end. And uh, early on, this was something that was discussed as far as putting a bending load on uh, uh, a 3 16 or a quarter inch rod end and that it could vary from builder to builder and that was something that we decided we wanted to avoid. Uh, rather, and you'll see in, a, in another image, the uh, uh, rod end is put on the push-pull tube between the elevator bell crank and the elevator horns so that it is in tension and compression. Further, this part was also changed from a geometry standpoint uh, from the pivot point to the, the top pivot uh, is uh, increased distance and it gives uh, a little bit more elevator travel without making the elevator 
uh, unnecessarily heavy. And this is a, a very nice uh, change. And if you'd like to incorporate this in your plans built uh, Micromong, by all means, go ahead. This image, uh, number 10, is basically depicting the rod ends that are used on the push-pull tubes. Uh, here, it's, uh, it, the image uh, shows the rod ends at the torque tube at the, the center of the cabin. And uh, you'll notice that uh, we're using an aluminum tube rather than the steel tubes that were previously uh, uh, welded up with stud ends and so forth. This has worked out well. Uh, the combination of the uh, increased weight of the rod ends and inserts uh, and the reduced weight of the aluminum tube uh, just gets us by probably with uh, uh, just a uh, no weight gain, no weight loss. So that's, that works out well. And the uh, taking the, um, uh, any play out of the control system really makes a difference. Uh, I think we're going to have to end this segment. It's going to be getting kind of long, and uh, there's a story I wanted to tell to help uh, help uh, builders to, to maybe to avoid getting into some problems making up these uh, push-pull tubes, but uh, I'll save that for another time also. Uh, send me a reminder. Okay, thanks a lot. See ya.